And, uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Madam Chairwoman, um, we just heard from one of our friends across the aisle that uh, we aren't acting in a bipartisan manner uh, to make sure this doesn't happen again, prevent it in the future, and hold those accountable. You know, I'm not exactly sure how you do all, all those things. It's tough, but I know how you don't do it. Uh, you don't begin by denying that it happened, as many have on their side of the aisle. Uh, you actually support a defense uh, supplemental of the security supplemental, and you support a commission. Uh, that's at least a good start. But uh, General Pyatt, let me ask you, uh, and, and the quotes can be wrong, but the quote I heard uh, was that you said a military presence could make the situation worse and the optics were bad. So this is an opportunity for you to clear the air. Uh, what exactly did you say about your concern of how uh, a military presence at the Capitol would look and what was your thinking at the time? Congressman, thank you. At, at the time, I don't recall using that word on 6 January because at the time the Capitol was clearly breached and overrun. It was, it was an ugly sight to, to look at. What we, were, what we were doing is discussing a range of options of what could be a use for the National Guard. And I was recommending that we would not use them as a clearing force because that is a mission for a highly trained at, at what, police at force. At what point did you say that? Do you recall? It was on it was on the two thirty phone call. We were exploring a range of options, and then afterwards we went into. But you, a plan. But you I'm sorry. And again, you saw what was happening at the Capitol, but you still didn't want to use National Guard as a clearing force. Is that correct? We wanted to use National Guard. I didn't think they were the best available force for what would be a very complex clearance mission that would require a highly trained uh, police force. I, I recommended law enforcement would be the best force for that mission. Uh, but I also recommended that the National Guard that we would continue to uh, build up their numbers would be good to be able to set an outer cordon or a perimeter around the Capitol. And that's and, the mission we and, ended up doing. And, but the mission you wanted to do was to, to have an security force around the court around the capitol while while the battle was taking place in the capitol we, we thought that things well things were going very fast congressman uh what we were seeing unfolding was that there would be a, bre a breach clearing force inside the capitol out police would be able to do more targeted arrests on the outside and we would be able to regain the perimeter security of the capitol we recommended that that be a good mission for the uh dc national guard with their riot gear but in effect, that would make them spectators to the battle for the most part, would it, would it not? It, it would control the, the ability of the other forces to do their mission. It's, it's, a, it's a typical security mission to secure the perimeter, to allow facil and facilitate the clearing. That way, no other for, form forces or uh, assailants or criminals would be able to break out of the capital and flee. They would be contained, and that would allow them to, to clear and control the objective and clear the capital. So it was just to act as a perimeter force. And again, I'm, I'm far from a military expert, but again, it sounds like they were gonna view the main battle from the inside. And a battle by that time, which you would have to acknowledge was lost. Uh, this was a battle and, and for the first time since 1814 we'd lost, and, and with respect, what you seem to be suggesting is that the force with the most strength would act as perimeter spectators and make sure the people who did all the damage didn't get away. Is that a, is that a fair way to characterize what you were proposing at that point? Congressman, the, the, the guardsmen that we had available at the time were unarmed. They were on a traffic control, crowd control mission. That was our concern. We had to get them remissioned, re-equipped, reconfigured. And that's why we were making these recommendations to, to the yeah. Secretary of the Army for how best to utilize a force. And we were trying to build that force up as fast as possibly could. Is, I think what you said before was that this wasn't a delay. It was a new plan on the fly, correct? Yes, Congressman. Is that another way of saying, again, I was in the room where it happened, so I, I think I can say this. Isn't that another way of saying that you weren't prepared in the first place? 
We were not positioned to respond to this crisis because the only force we had committed in the district were unarmed soldiers on traffic control points and crowd control. We had to recall the DC National Guard. We had to reposition those forces, you reconfigure and reconfigure. worried about reform. optics. What we, this was the first battle in our nation's capital since 1814. We lost it. You wanted to be spectators and you wanted to direct traffic while hundreds of people were injured and five people died. Uh, I yield back. Elman yields back. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out? How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, that. last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focus on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, that, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. Yeah. And I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th 
is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it ba via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, it, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most, uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.